Okay guys, um, this is Hessel and I'm uh, walking through the electrodynamics or current electricity part A answers. It's the celebration of learning, the multiple choice version um, that Miss Tercy put together. Thank you, Miss Tercy. Um, and uh, let's get started with our answers. Oh yeah. First question, all electricity is from the motion of electrons. Um, the electrons are in orbit around the nucleus, the protons are locked in the nucleus, and neutrons are up in the nucleus, and neutrons don't have charge anyway. So electrons are what carry the charge, choice D. In the second question, they give us the charge in coulombs, and the time as 500 seconds charges 100 coulombs, and they want to know what is the current. I go to my formula, I equals Q over T. I have the Q, it's 100 coulombs. I have the time, it's 500 seconds. 100 divided by 500 is 0.2, so our current is 0.2 amps, choice A. Three is also a current question. They tell us that the current is five times 10 to the negative five amps. They give us the time is five seconds, but they wanna know how many electrons is that? When they ask for the number of electrons or for the number of charges, they're really asking for charge. They're asking for Q. Now, when you use I equals Q over T, Q is in coulombs, but they're asking for the number of electrons, and so they're really asking for the number of elementary charges, so you'll need to solve for the charge in coulombs and then convert to elementary charges. So I worked out the math here. I have I equals Q over T, I put in the current, I put in the time, cross multiply, and you solve for the charge. It's 2.5 times 10 to the negative 4 coulombs. So I know that an electron is negative 1 elementary charge, I want to know how many elementary charges is 2.5 times 10 to the negative 4 coulombs. I look to page 1 of my reference tables that has a lot of my constants and conversions, and I see that one elementary charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So I set up a ratio. I say how many elementary charges is to 2.5 times 10 to the negative 4 coulombs if one elementary charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. The way the ratio works is I put x in the numerator over what I'm trying to convert, and then on the right side, I put the conversion ratio with the same units, like elementary charges over coulombs, elementary charges over coulombs, and then I solve for x. I'm going to wind up dividing 2.5 times 10 to the negative 4 by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. I do the division, I get 1.5625 times 10 to the 15 elementary charges, I see that I have two significant figures right here in the 2.5, so my answer has two significant figures. I get 1.6 times 10 to the 15 elementary charges, choice C. Number four says, what's a coulomb per second? And our choices are watt, ohm, volt, or ampere. So per means divide. So I write a coulomb over a second, and I know coulombs are the units for charge quantity in seconds of time, so that's Q over T, and I know that Q over T is current, and current is measured in amperes, so that would be choice D, ampere. Now, number five, um, what it says there is true. They make extension cord wires thicker because they're long, and we know that as length increases, the resistance increases, um, so you wanna counter that, so they make the wires thicker. But what it's actually asking is, is what is the, uh, what, how does the resistance vary um, for length and for cross-sectional area? And so the formula we're interested in is R equals rho L over A. And I can see that resistance is directly proportional to the length. As the length goes up, then the resistance also goes up. But resistance is inversely proportional to area. So if you have the area increase, like it's a thicker wire, then the resistance goes down, inversely proportional. So yeah, if you're gonna make your wire longer, the resistance will go up, but then if you make it thicker, you increase the cross-sectional area, which brings the resistance back down, countering the change from the length. So yes, resistance is directly proportional to the length and inversely proportional to cross-sectional area, that is A. Okay, next page, number six. So these are graphs of a wire's length versus their resistance. And we know from number five that the resistance of a wire is directly proportional to its length. So you wanna pick the graph that shows a direct proportion. So here's our graph. Any direct proportion follows this shape. 
It's a straight linear line starting from the origin going straight up. Technically, resistance should be on the y-axis and length should be on the x-axis because resistance is the dependent variable. It depends on the length, but whatever, that's the correct shape. Choice C shows no relationship, which is not true. Choice D is the inverse proportion curve. That would be true if the y-axis were area, but it's not. It's length. Um, and A just shows a steady decrease downwards. That's not a proportionality graph. So Seven wants to know what happens if a wire gets hot, if its temperature increases. For most metals, if the temperature increases, the resistivity of that wire increases. Um, that's the funny P that people refer to. They call that rho. So if temperature goes up, resistivity goes up. I know that the formula for resistance is R equals rho L over A. So resistivity rho and resistance R are directly proportional. So if the temperature goes up, the resistivity goes up. And if the resistivity goes up, then the resistance of the wire goes up. So we have another choice B. The resistance would increase if the temperature of the wire went up. Next page again, number eight. Number eight is similar to number six, but number six had resistance versus length, which is directly proportional. Resistance versus cross-sectional area is inversely proportional. As the cross-sectional area of a wire increases, its resistance decreases. And so any inverse or inverse square proportion in the first quadrant follows a hyperbolic curve, looks like that. And that graph, that graph shape is for anything that is inverse, uh, inverse proportional or inverse square proportion. So that's going to be choice C. Next question. So number nine makes reference to 20 degrees Celsius. They do that because that's room temperature. And it's asking about four different materials that you could build a wire out of. Aluminum, gold, nichrome, or tungsten. So what a wire is made out of is connected to its resistivity. Resistivity depends on what the wire is made out of and also its temperature. This isn't a temperature question. Even though it's referring to 20 degrees Celsius, that's the room temperature that is used on the chart on page 4 of our reference table. So go to page four of your reference table and take a look at the materials on the bottom right of the page. On that chart, I see aluminum, copper, gold, nichrome, silver, and tungsten, all with their resistivity values in ohm meters. So in number nine, they're looking for the least resistance. So of the four choices, I want to find the one that has the, the lowest resistivity value because the smaller the resistivity, the smaller the resistance because they're directly proportional. So of aluminum, gold, nichrome, and tungsten, I have 2.82, 2.44, 150, and 5.60 times 10 to the negative 8 ohm meters. And that's not a typo. Nichrome is much bigger than the rest of them. I want the least. And of the chart, gold at 2.44 times 10 to the negative 8 ohm meters, that is going to have the least resistivity and so the least resistance. So if you go into like the club or something and you got your chain on, don't stick it in like an outlet. You'd be like, it'd be like a bad time. So for number 10, they give us the length, the cross-sectional area, and the resistance. They tell us that the wire is at room temperature, that's the reference temperature, the 20 degrees Celsius, and they want to know what the wire is made out of. Now you got to remember that this is connected to the resistivity. They're actually asking you to solve for what is the resistivity of the wire. So we look to R equals rho L over A, and we stick in the resistance, the length, and the cross-sectional area, and we're solving for the resistivity rho. Multiply both sides by the area, divide both sides by the length, and it will give you the resistivity. When you do the math, you wind up with 1.50 times 10 to the negative 6 ohm meters. Now, in order to find out what material that is, I have to refer to page 4 of the reference table, the resistivity chart on the bottom right. Now, looking at that chart, I do not see 1.50 times 10 to the negative 6 ohm meters. However, I do see 150 times 10 to the negative 8 ohm meters. Tricky, tricky. So that 1.5 times 10 to the negative 6, we know, is also 150 times 10 to the negative 8 ohm meters. Looking at the chart, that gives us nichrome. Nichrome is an alloy of nickel and chromium, and they use it for heating applications.
That's 10 questions down. We are halfway through. Next page, number 11. Here we are with number 11. We have a graph of potential difference versus current. Potential difference on a y-axis. Current is on the x-axis. Uh, potential difference, we also know, is voltage. And the question is asking, what is the resistance of the conductor based on the graph? Since the graph is linear, I can see that it's representing Ohm's law. Now, Ohm's law <clears throat> is R equals V over I, but it's actually that voltage is directly proportional to current, and the ratio of voltage to current is the resistance. Not everything is what we call ohmic. In fact, regular light bulbs are not ohmic. As they get hot, the resistivity increases and the resistance increases, and this is not a straight line. You wind up with a curve for voltage versus current, but that's not the case in this question. So if we have a line, we know that the slope of a line is rise over run, or delta y over delta x. y-axis here is voltage, x-axis here is current, and so the slope here would be v over i, which would be the resistance. We call that the physical significance of the slope. The physical significance of this slope is resistance. So we've picked two points that are on the line. First point is 0.2 amps and 2 volts, and second point is 0.7 amp and 7 volts. So I run a slope calculation through. I have delta y over delta x of 5 over 0.5. So I wind up with a slope of 10 volts over amps, or 10 ohms. So the resistance, which is the slope here, is 10 ohms. Remember that if you're doing a slope problem and you're not sure as to the units for the slope, you can just do y units over x units. You could just leave it as volts over amps, which is correct. So um, just remember that. So this guy is D 10 ohms. Number 12. So I have four different circuits here uh, with ammeters and voltmeters, and it wants to know which is the correct way to measure current in a resistor. Each circuit has one resistor and a battery. Uh, two circuits have voltmeters and two have ammeters. Well, first of all, a voltmeter by itself is not going to tell you the current in a resistor. So it's not B and it's not D. Also, I can tell you that B is called an open circuit because sticking a voltmeter in series um, actually increases the resistance of the circuit a whole heck of a lot. Voltmeters have very, very, very high resistance, and when you connect something in series, the resistance increases. So if you connect a voltmeter in series, you're going to uh, raise the resistance of your circuit into the stratosphere, effectively killing the current, shutting off the current. Like kind of like as if you were opening the circuit, so they call it an open circuit. And speaking of the voltmeter, I can tell you that D is the correct answer if you were trying to measure voltage. Voltage is you connect the voltmeter in parallel across the resistor. You can see as if the voltmeter were going in for a hug, one hand on one side, one hand on the other, with a parallel connection. That is the correct uh, connection for a voltmeter to measure voltage. That's not what the question asked. It said, how do you measure current in a resistor? Well, ammeters are always wired in series right next to whatever they're trying to measure. They measure current, and they're in series right next to, before or after, what they're trying to measure, holding hands instead of giving a hug. So A is the correct answer because the ammeter is in series. A comment, though, about C. Not only is C wrong, but C is dangerous. Ammeters have very, very low resistance. When you conduct something in series, you increase the resistance. Increasing the resistance would affect the current. So ammeters have very low resistance, so they, they, they don't affect the resistance of the whole circuit, um, and they can take a measurement of the current. Now, if you connect an ammeter in parallel, like in choice C, then all of the current is going to go screaming through that ammeter. A little bit will go through the resistor, but mainly you're going to shoot up the current in your circuit. You may have heard of a short circuit. That is a short circuit where you have a very low resistance. Um, it's as if you're giving the shortest path for the resistance to flow, um, for the current to flow. And it's a very low resistance, very high current, and that can actually be dangerous. That could start a fire. So yeah, you want your ammeter to be in series with whatever it's measuring, so the answer would be A. If I did want to measure voltage, I would put the voltmeter in parallel across the resistor that would measure voltage. With number 13, we start looking at series and parallel circuits. 
um, the number one thing that you want to concern yourself when you see a circuit question is what kind of circuit is it? Is it a series circuit or is it a parallel circuit? This question states explicitly that these resistors are connected in series. Now I usually write down given information when I see a problem like this, but I'm reading through the problem and it says the current of the two ohm resistor is two amps. What's the current of the four ohm resistor? And I remember that in series, the current is the same at all points. Be careful with that. I did not say it remains the same. If I change the resistance, the current will change as well. If I increase the resistance, the current goes down. If I decrease the resistance, the current goes up. But it would be the same current value at all points in that series loop. So same current everywhere. And if the current in the 2 ohm resistor is 2 amps, then the current in the 4 ohm resistor is 2 amps, B. Next page. Another circuit question, you first have to identify the kind of circuit. I can see that those two resistors are right next to each other, holding hands, and there's one loop from the power source through the two resistors. This is a series circuit. We are not messing around here. This is a series circuit. S series, yeah. Not sure why they wrote power source instead of using the symbol for a battery. Uh, that would have looked like this battery. And again, just to illustrate, um, here is the loop I was talking about. That is one loop right there. That is a series connection. Now, the only information I'm given is I have these two voltmeters that are in parallel hugging or going across the two individual resistors. I have a 5 volt uh, voltmeter on the left and I have a 10 volt voltmeter on the right. And the question is asking, what's the voltage of the power supply? That would be the voltage of the source. Well, I know that in series, the total voltage is the sum of the individual voltage drops. So I have 5 volts here and 10 volts. So I add those guys up and I get 15 volts. This is actually an application of conservation of energy. Um, the power supply is providing the energy per unit charge. Um, and the things in the circuit are using the energy per unit charge. Um, and so the total of the things using that energy, using the voltage out in the circuit, has to equal the total of the things providing the, uh, the voltage. So yes, total voltage will equal the individual drops. This is not the case in a parallel circuit, because in a parallel circuit, all of the connections are independent as if they were by themselves. So that conservation of energy law still applies, but in a parallel circuit, the individual circuits, like circuit elements, are independent as if they're just by themselves and they're the only ones there on the battery. That does make a difference for the currents in a parallel circuit, but I'm getting into parallel circuits, but number 14 is about a series circuit. Let's move on. Number 15, I can see those three resistors right there are holding hands. There's only one loop. There are no meters there. That is a series connection. I think it's pretty clear. I can see the values of the individual resistors are 1, 2, and 3 ohms. And I can see the value of the voltage of the power supply is 6 volts. And it wants to know what's the current in the circuit. And it doesn't tell me anything about the current. I'm going to have to do this in more than one step. I'm also going to need to organize my information. So I'm thinking this is going to need a table. When I make a table for a circuit problem, it's the same thing as a givens list. I'm just kind of organizing it in a table form instead of in a list form. The rows are going to be how many things I have in the circuit. There are one, two, three things in my circuit. And then on the bottom of my table, I have the total values. And then the columns in my, in my table are going to be for voltage, current, and resistance. Now, I could add another column for power if I wanted, but a V, I, and R, if I know two of those guys, I can solve for the power. As P equals V, I, P equals I squared R, and P equals V squared over R. All right, let's fill out the table with things that we know. Resistance, 1, 2, and 3 ohms. 1 ohm, 2 ohm, and 3 ohms. And I know that the total voltage is 6 volts for the whole circuit. And it wants to know what is the total current, which we know from series that if I know one current, I know them all. 
Well, right away I can see that with the individual resistors, I can get the total resistance by adding them up. So that's going to give me a total or equivalent resistance of 6 ohm. And I can stick that in for the equivalent resistance, 6 ohms. And with that information, with the total voltage and equivalent resistance, I can get the total current because R equals V over I for the whole circuit and for each individual thing in the circuit. Um, so I can use 6 ohms for the equivalent resistance for the whole circuit equals 6 volts over I total. Cross multiply, solve for I total, I get 1 amp. So that is A. You can stick that into your table if you wish. 1 amp. Number 16. So yeah, the first thing we do is we identify the type of circuit. It says that the resistors are connected in series. So this is a series circuit. It's asking about potential difference, which we also know as voltage. And it's asking about the potential difference across each individual resistor in series. I know that in a parallel circuit, all of the branches, all of the resistors are independent of each other. They all get the total voltage as if they were by themselves. And so all of the voltage values are equal in parallel. This isn't parallel, this is series. In a series circuit, we learned earlier that the voltage is shared across the circuit. Um, so each uh, resistor in series has, uh, has, shares the total voltage that's available. So we know the answer is not D, that would be true of a parallel circuit. So really then the question is asking is how does voltage vary with resistance? Well, we know that R equals V over I, that's Ohm's law, and voltage and resistance are directly proportional. The bigger the voltage drop, the bigger the resistance, or the bigger the resistance, the bigger the voltage drop, uh, vice versa. So voltage is directly proportional to R. Um, the voltage varies directly with resistance, that is choice A. Next page. So number 17 makes reference to a parallel circuit, resistors connected in parallel to some voltage. So again, the first thing we do is identify the type of circuit. It is a parallel circuit. And it asks, as you connect more resistors in parallel, what happens to the potential difference or the voltage across each resistor? Well, I've said before that in parallel, everything is independent as if it were by itself. So if you add more things in parallel, the voltage across each individual thing doesn't change because they're independent. Um, so the potential difference across each resistor will remain the same. The rule for this is V total equals V1 equals V2 equals V3 etc. And it doesn't matter how many things you have. They all, they're all going to be equal to the source voltage. That's why all of the outlets in your house are at 120 volts. That happens to be the source voltage and they're all wired in parallel. So 18 is a fun question because there are both series connections and parallel connections. A and C are series holding hands and then B and D are in parallel. It's not super obvious that they're giving each other a hug, but you can see they're in parallel with each other. And the question wants to know which two resistor pairs have the same equivalent resistance. So you're going to have to solve for the equivalent resistance for each one. So I wrote them all out. Um, the A circuit and C circuit are series and the B circuit and D circuit are parallel. So in series, you just simply add up the resistors. In parallel, you use the equivalent resistance equation. Um, so using B as an example, I have 1 over 8 plus 1 over 8, which is 2 over 8. So 1 over R equivalent is 2 over 8, so R equivalent is 8 over 2, so that would be 4 ohms. Um, do the same thing for D. I did not write the equation for D, I just kind of wrote out the substitution to save room. But for D, you get 1 ohm. So the question asks which two have the same equi uh, equal res resistances or the equivalent resistances are the same, they're equal to each other, and that would be B and C because they both have 4 ohms worth of resistance. And so that would be choice B, B and C. I'll give you a tip. If you have a pair of resistors in parallel, say 8 and 8, um, in series you just add them up to 16, but in parallel, if they're the same, say 8 and 8, the equivalent resistance is going to wind up being half that, it would be 4. Um, as you increase the number of resistors, suppose you had 3 of them, 8, 8 and 8, the equivalent resistance would be a third of 8, which is 2.67.
if you had four 8 ohm resistors, 8, 8, 8, and 8, in parallel, that would the equivalent resistance would be 2 ohms, would be a quarter of the, uh, of the individual guys. Okay, next and last page. Good thing because my pacing on the back 10 is not as good as the front 10. Okay, number 19, what the heck is that? Um, that's called a junction. Uh, and uh, basically you work these out by using something called a junction rule. Um, I have one, two, three, four, five, six wires, and I have some current going into the junction and some current coming out of the junction. Um, I can see that based on the direction of the arrows. So I have three amps coming in. Um, that's coming in from the top left and going clockwise around a circle. Uh, again, three amps coming in, four amps going out, one amp going out, two amps going out, some ammeter measuring current. Then on the left there, I have two amps coming in. So the principle, um, you can consider that this is a parallel circuit because there's a junction. In a series circuit, there's only one loop. There's no loop here. In fact, it's looking at a junction. And since we're talking about um, currents in parallel, I know that the total current um, provided to the circuit is the sum of the currents, or in other words, the total current coming out is the total current coming in. That's actually because of um, conservation of charge. The total charge leaving has to be the total charge coming back. So I have 3 amps and 2 amps going into the junction, and I have 4, 1, and 2 amps coming out. So I have 5 in and 7 out. Since the total going in has to be the total coming out, then that 5 amps needs another 2 amps coming in in order to balance. If ever you see a question like this, um, could be uh, six wires, four wires, three wires, whatever. Take a look at the arrow directions for in and out. The total current going in has to be the total current coming out. So they're asking about where should you place an ammeter to measure current. I know that an ammeter needs to be in series, not in parallel. So right off the bat, that eliminates choice one as an answer, because one is in parallel. That position is in parallel. If I put an ammeter there, I could short circuit my circuit. Now you might be tempted to say position four, but position four is in series with the power supply. So that right there, position four is in series right there with the power supply. It's measuring the total current. It didn't ask for total current. It asked for the current through resistor R1. So I want a position that is in series with R1. It might not be obvious, but position 2 is in series with R2. R2 is right here, and it's in series with R2 right there, uh, but didn't ask about 2. So Hessel, answer the question already. right? I have R1 right here, and if I'm going to measure current through it, I need an ammeter in series holding hands with R1. It is position 3 right there. So the answer is C3. If you watched this so far, thank you for watching. Thank you. Bye. Stay tuned for part B. But wait. Wow, you can't even read that. Great job. I thought actually the last thing you might want is a full list of all of the answers. So you could just scrub to the end of the video and look at the full list um, in one place. Uh, that'd probably be helpful, right? So here it is. There you go. Okay, the next up is part B. In another video, because I only have about a minute left. Goodbye.